I am a huge fan of the patented Cozy game, being someone who's played Animal Crossing for more hours than every episode of One Piece combined and perfected their Stardew Valley save with gut-wrenching hyperfocus. Soft scenery, adorable animals, vibrant coloring, and stylized animation own the genre, with magical worlds and engaging characters working behind the scenes to make your experience unforgettable. Cozy games have made their mark on the world time and time again, topping bestseller lists and raking up content creators to show off each new title added to the roster. The very idea of a cozy game radiates the concept of what gaming looks like at its core, an escape from the real world, a way to de-stress and create. Many who took part in the cozy sphere agreed that it was a much needed addition for the gaming community as a whole, and I agree, especially as somebody who got called a lot of things in Call of Duty. Please don't burn me at the stake for being a former Call of Duty player, okay I beg, I beg of thee. I've made my whole channel hinge upon these games that are made to bring a sense of peace and foster new beginnings. I have a soft spot for this genre and the happiness it has brought me personally, and I always will. However, of course, joy and sunshine isn't where the story ends. Recently, a trend of cozy games receiving less than positive reviews, outcries for more variety, and lowering game lifespans has emerged. The overwhelming presence of farming sims has caused them to dominate the market as a whole. Fresh ideas seem far and few between, and once bustling nooks of the internet focusing on particular games have gone radio silent, leading a lot of people to wonder why. What happened to the boom that seemed unstoppable? The short answer is that money ruins everything. The long answer is the rest of this video, and if you're one of those freaks like me who enjoys listening to overly pretentious video essays, I'd love it if you stuck around. So sit back, relax, and let's talk about coziness. We're gonna start today with a brief history of the cozy game takeover and how we got to this position in the first place. Many people marked the beginning of cozy games with Animal Crossing New Horizons or Stardew Valley, and I'd agree that's where the real trend began, but the timeline of wholesome, atmospheric games started in the late 90s and early 2000s. Harvest Moon, first released in 1996, was a pioneer for what we now see quite often, calming, life cycle oriented farming sims. You play as a farmer who inherited his grandfather's farm, now tasked with caring for it and restoring it to its former glory. The game was a true breakthrough for the time in terms of its facets. It didn't have levels, bosses, combat, or some evil force to overthrow. Its goal was only to let you build a life, grow some stupid little crops, and own a stupid little sheep. A dream life, honestly. I fucking love sheep. Other games popular at the time, like Mario or Zelda, were far more action-packed and heroic. The marriage aspect was also incredibly new to mainstream games and allowed so many kids to experience their first gay awakening, or so I've heard. I didn't grow up playing Harvest Moon games, but after seeing Nami, I get it. Harvest Moon was a massive risk to sink money into when judging its stark differences from other competitors. There was no perfect way to predict how well it would do, nothing like it had really been done before. But that risk paid off massively for developer Yasuhiro Wada. Harvest Moon became an incredibly successful series, a staple of its genre, and paved the way for future titles. Not only had Harvest Moon proved that there was a market for these kinds of games, but it showed what was really possible in the entire gaming market. Games like Animal Crossing Population Growing began to follow suit in terms of energy and playstyles, though differing in some key aspects and, you know, improving upon the whole life sim idea. Animal Crossing has managed to remain one of the original IT titles, with nostalgia blooming from every corner of that fucked up tanuki for many. Not me though, count your days. I don't want to go too in depth regarding Animal Crossing's creation and gameplay because I'm almost certain that many of you have heard more than enough about it, but it is pretty important to understand that although Animal Crossing did have a dedicated fan base and some pretty good sales numbers, it didn't reach any sort of global phenomenon status in its early years. Of course, it's far more standard to see games become a quiet favorite when they were created before gaming communities were super common on the internet, but you know what I mean. Nintendogs, first released for the Nintendo DS in 2005, also followed this sort of easygoing vibe and took a lot more people by storm, mostly due to its marketing as a great game for children in homes without pets and also a must-have for young girls who want to care for something. With the DS's major success, an absolute fuck-ton of games were released for the console, and that somewhat meant that more playstyles were able to be explored. Things like The Sims, even though it was the fucked-up, haunted hotel version of The Sims, I don't know either. I love that game though. Fantasy life and a multitude of style and fashion games flooded stores. 
Sure, not all of these titles were objectively cozy, but they did alter the landscape and allow for more creativity to come in the future. A few years later, more Animal Crossing and Harvest Moon titles had come out, bringing the brands further and further out into the open, and with them, the cozy genre itself. Animal Crossing New Leaf, which came out in 2013, had blossomed into the best received game in the franchise, introducing new players to the series and slowly inching it out into a recognizable IP. Harvest Moon was out there doing the same thing it had been doing for 20 years. This is a time where we see a sort of indie game boom begin. If you were there, I think you'll pretty soon realize what the fuck I'm talking about. Friends, I hate to break this to you, it's Minecraft time. As a closet Minecraft enjoyer, I would love to pretend that I wasn't in the fucking trenches of survival mode when I was a child, but I was there too. We're all in this together. Minecraft, which was officially released in 2011, was not only a massive deal back then, but has maintained an incomprehensibly large player base even to this day. I'm sure you know about it. I'm not gonna say anything here. The game, which used an open world format and allowed for both elements of class combat and newer, creative-driven playstyles was an instant hit, taking over the fairly new YouTube gaming community at the time and setting a brand new precedent for what could truly be done in video games. If you're aware of the 9-11 to Ellen's downfall pipeline, this would be the physicist to the Josh Hutcherson whistle meme pipeline. Uh, I regret being born. Anyway, the building aspect became a massive source of the game's reach, especially for idiot little creative kids who like to sink their time into building huge castles. Don't know who would ever do that. Mods and texture packs gave an artistic outlet to players, much like the Sims community had for CC. That doesn't even begin to cover what people have been able to do with the base game, but holy shit, has Minecraft ever changed and defined its sandbox game genre. This, combined with the release of Terraria, a similarly styled survival game a few months earlier, brought two exciting concepts to the general public. These sandbox games are actually the shit and pixel art rocks. The accessibility of pixel art games was a game changer, haha, <laughs> pun intended, and set the precedent for games to come. About four years down the line, a game called Undertale came out, garnering a smaller but incredibly eager fan base. This game took the use of pixel art and combined it with an incredible story and super fulfilling world, twisting the idea in a new direction. You play as Frisk, a child who has fallen into a strange land that monsters were banished to after a war with humans. You know what fucking Undertale is, who am I kidding? You guys can't kill me, I was there, I lived it. There are years that you just will never be able to get back and 2015 is definitely one of them for me. If you for some godforsaken reason managed to escape the Undertale fad back when it came out, I highly recommend taking a look at it. It still holds up in my opinion, it's so good. But if you did play it, you may be thinking, wait, Undertale is in an open world game, it has combat, it's terrifying at points. How the hell is this a cozy game and why are you mentioning it? Well, first of all, it's mostly not one. Except for the atmospheric, escapist, heartfelt storyline. It strives for a similar world building effect to a lot of cozy games, and it was a first in its kind in many ways, especially in terms of showing off what you can do with one computer and a bit of elbow grease. Basically, no, it's not a cozy game, but I do think it set the precedent for what could become one. It has such a whimsical, different vibe from so many other games at the time, and I feel like it was crucial in developing that sort of style, so I wanted to mention it. But soon after that, it arrived. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about Stardew fucking Valley. I'm sure you know very well by this point, but following your grandfather's death, you, a Joja Mart employee, move out to the countryside to maintain a farm left to you. You're able to meet a town full of characters, some dateable, and work with the land to complete the community center and return your world to its former glory. It's a staple. It's what a lot of people think of first when they think of cozy games. It's made such a name for itself because of its sheer amazingness. You can never deny how much of an impact Stardew Valley had on literally everything it touched. Eric Baroni, the sole creator of Stardew Valley, took plenty of inspiration from Harvest Moon. However, he improved upon it tremendously, and thus an absolute beast of a game rose from the ashes that Harvest Moon once was. Stardew Valley was rich in activities, from mining to farming to dating to combat. It allowed you to both follow a goal and explore the world at your own pace, making it a good fit for almost any playstyle. 
It was adorably animated, full of heart, and held a perfect countryside where nobody will bother you and you'll never have to see your boss again vibe. The game had an incredibly well-cultivated aesthetic, and I'd honestly say it paved the way for a lot of the cottagecore trends we saw in the coming years, as somebody who has a fucking mushroom house tattoo so I can't speak. Overall, Stardew Valley ignited a real interest in games of these types and helped the indie scene develop even further. The success of Stardew was absolutely monumental, and it helped the cozy game idea reach outside of its usual bubble. Hold on to that for a moment as I reference Animal Crossing as fast as I possibly can because god knows I've spoken about it more times than it reasonably needs to be spoken about. Please see my eight other video essays on the topic. Anyway, Animal Crossing's massive success after its release in 2020 finally gave a voice to these sort of outlier games that didn't quite have a defined space carved out for them yet. Animal Crossing hit the whole world and had no intention of letting anyone out of its grips. Social media specifically was absolutely flooded with content about it, which not only acted as advertisement for the game, but invited more people to dip their toes into gaming as a whole, which is fantastic. Cozy indie games began seeing the spotlight more and more, giving life to farming sims and visual novels that may not have seen the light of day without the cultural acceptance of Animal Crossing. A Short Hike, Unpacking, Spiritfarer, Cozy Grove, A Little to the Left, Barren Breakfast, Calico, Coral Island. The amount of indie games released that made a huge impact on their player base was truly mind-blowing, and the amount of developers that found success in this space is absolutely fantastic. It not only created an outline of the possibilities for players, but an outline for content creators too, and that genre of gaming videos blossomed. Now, I love a Pokemon game as much as the next person, but to be honest, I am the biggest sucker for short indie games. I'm fully aware that I sound like the sick fuck who asked you to name three songs from the band on your t-shirt, but I try not to be as pretentious about it, even though this video is going to be incredibly pretentious. There's something to be said about people feeling superior for knowing about smaller games, but I see it as a win to the people who made those games. However you feel about indie game fans, it's good that creators are getting supported. You can go be a stick in the mud somewhere fucking else. New games giving you the opportunity to take over your grandfather's farm were coming out left and right, and it was the perfect time to be an enjoyer of cozy gaming. That is, until suddenly it wasn't. See, indie games like these became recognizable enough for me to mention them and probably have you recognize at least a few of them. Although Stardew Valley's innovation struck a perfect chord, it was a one in a million situation, and games similar to it only truly took over after its success. Indie developers are the heart of cozy games, that's the object truth. Yes, Stardew Valley got recognition because it was great, but that's not how things usually work. The best game ever could be buried in the Steam files with absolutely no advertising, and nobody would ever know about it. One thing I think is incredibly interesting is the resurgence of Harvest Moon, now called Story of Seasons. Many people regard the newer versions to be a lot lower quality than the older titles, losing the charm that they originally had. However, XC began pushing out more Story of Seasons games than ever, and they saw an uptick in popularity despite the quality not improving. Why is this? Well, because other farming sims were doing well. By the way, I'm not talking about the most recent one, I've seen mixed reviews for it, but people seem to like it a bit better. The farming sim boom began, and people were snatching up every one that got the attention shifted onto it. Puff Pals Island Skies became a huge social media sensation after its announcement. Island Skies is a farming sim with the inclusion of adorable, fuzzy animation and sweet little Puff Pals, which are based off of the Puff Pals plushies. The huge amount of attention this got from fans of Animal Crossing and Stardew Valley allowed its Kickstarter to be funded almost instantly, and for good reason it looks really cute. Coral Island, a farming sim similar to Stardew Valley but with 3D animation and a few added features, was also announced on Kickstarter and similarly hit its goal extremely quick. Fay Farm, a cozy farming simulator set in a fairy town, was announced sometime afterward. You get the picture, the same game released over and over again with different gimmicks. Paleo, farming sim MMO, Paleo Pines, Fields of Mystria. Slowly but surely, people started to catch on to the fact that the only real cozy games being pushed to them were drained of any variety and used the same basic principles taken from Stardew Valley and Animal Crossing. Farm, restore the town, talk to townsfolk. 
Now, in no way am I saying that I believe any of the games mentioned are poorly made, uninspired, or at all bad. Personally, I am a fan of farming sims, and some ideas need repetition in order to be perfected. In fact, I recommend you check out any of the ones that I've shown here. Many of them add a lot to the farming sim concept and don't deserve to be looked over for just being farming sims. These developers put their hearts into them, and it's unfair to not give them a chance. Making plenty of these types of games isn't even a bad thing in my opinion, but it is the generalization that I've seen passed around a lot on social media, and so I wanted to discuss it. I hope a lot of you got mad that I kind of insinuated that farming sims were bad. I hope you wanted to go check them out, because that was exactly my intention by showing them to you. However, that isn't to say I don't understand the frustration concerning a lack of variety and the confusion centering the constant creation of farming sims. They're everywhere, and even I get a little tired of them sometimes being someone who enjoys them deeply. There is a certain dullness that comes with being unable to avoid them, and if you're not a fan of farming sims, that makes the entire situation even worse. It can make you more vitriolic to these types of games. Or maybe you're just sick and tired of watering your fucking crops. I don't know, maybe, maybe. We look for new ideas constantly, and they seem to not be here anymore. They seem to have moved on and lost the spark that they usually have. But why? We first have to think for a moment about why cozy games were ever innovative in the first place. Video games have, for a long time, been seen as one thing. Action, combat, skill, time challenges. Things like shooters and dungeon crawlers and platformers were always seen as the fundamentals for a video game, you just couldn't make one without it. When people go to come up with new ideas, especially in larger corporate offices, they have to look at what sells and what doesn't. If there's no data on a certain kind of game, there's there's no way to know if that game will sell. Therefore, it's a risk. Like I said, making Harvest Moon was a risk, making Animal Crossing was a risk. With companies whose ultimate goal is to profit, 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 a risk means the possibility of not hitting that sales number. Of course, you can always improve on an idea, I'm not saying you can't, but a lot of the games that come to mind when you think of good indie games are ones that absolutely blew their competition out of the water with new ideas. But first and foremost, you have to think of money. You see that these platformers and shooters are doing well, so you make more shooters. It's a simple rule that we see everywhere in life. Sequels are released because the first movie did well, more restaurant locations opened because the first one was successful. If you follow that outline, there will always be a baseline of players who enjoy the concept and therefore will always pick up the game. Sure, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet may not have been a smash hit, but fans of Pokemon will still buy it, including me. As long as these companies can still make a buck, they'll keep making the same games over and over again. But wait, I spent most of this video discussing indie game developers, not massive corporations. Well, there is a lot going on here, so let's talk about it. These indie developers feel the heat the companies do to profit far more than a CEO in a plush leather chair ever will. These teams are often indescribably small and low on funding, meaning the development of their next game and the food on their table rides on their projects doing well. The risk factor is multiplied dramatically when the cushion of being a huge corporation is taken away. Nintendo doesn't have to worry about closing doors and firing every single employee if one game does badly, but indie developers do. Not only do they have to rely on chance and the big corporations creating trends, but they must show that they're deserving of any attention, and most of them are. Of course, plenty of indie games have done well without the need for any trends, but that is, again, a once-in-a-lifetime thing. You don't just get free advertising consistently unless the algorithm loves you. So, when a big farming sim does well, of course smaller developers might follow suit, and maybe they even do want to make a better farming sim. Either way, they need that cushion to continue making games they love, they need that money to continue developing. They hope to share even just a bit of that spotlight with bigger games who have massive marketing budgets and get to overshadow just using their name. So yeah, a lot of farming sims have been produced by indie developers lately. They could take a risk, sure. Harvest Moon and Animal Crossing were risks that paid off, but they were risks headed by giant game companies, and it just doesn't work the same way for small developers. Even when games are shown in things like Nintendo's Indie Game Showcase, only particular ones that have been able to break through even get the chance to reach viewers. Advertisers and companies giving a platform to these games only want to look at what will make them money. If they shout out a game, it's because they believe it's going to do well. There is no charity about it. Most games don't even get to get in the 
room with these people. These companies want irrefutable data on what sells, and a lot of the games that sell are, you guessed it, farming sims. The truly exciting, new, innovative, never-been-done-before shit has to find an insane amount of luck to even see the light of day. Capitalism doesn't breed innovation. Only passion can do that. Once in a blue moon, a person taking a leap that has everything riding on it will work out. But dozens and dozens and dozens of times more, it leaves people's lives in shambles. In no way am I saying you shouldn't take a chance and create something. Go, make the perfect video game, I believe in you. Great games have come from people who wanted to make money, I'm not saying that's not true either. I am only saying that this new, exciting type of game you're all looking for could be there. It just hasn't been seen yet. But it's also unfair to look down on studios who are just trying to make a living by writing off of trends that already exist. Maybe they think they could do something different with it, and oftentimes they do, or they want to use it as a jumping off point to make something they really believe in. Whatever intentions they had while making these games, it doesn't mean it's the end of exciting, cozy games. Small studios have no massive marketing teams to bring their games out of the shadows. Their resources don't allow for their ideas to reach the same recognition big studios receive with ease, and even if they did, people will side with IPs they know more often than not. So what can you do to change this? How can you help new, exciting games flourish? Well, first of all, buy indie games. That's pretty simple, I think we all know that. But also think about it for a moment. When do indie games without a big marketing budget usually actually see the world? Social media. Retweet, follow, like, share, make fan art, make sure that these games know that they have a chance. Support things on Kickstarter, share everywhere you can because that's the only way that you are going to be able to help, especially when a game is still in development. Buy merch, support on Patreon, there is always a way. There is always a fucking way, okay? Social media is the reason so many of the games that you love have been able to flourish, so contribute. That's all anybody can ask for, really. I do have a couple recommendations for you guys. Sticky Business by Spellgarden Games, which I've streamed once or twice, allows you to run your own adorable sticker shop. You can create designs, follow a heartfelt storyline, and slowly upgrade your shop. The whole vibe of this is incredibly fun and a great way to de-stress, and I've created so many cute things on here. Witchy Life Story by Sundew Studios is a similarly formatted visual novel, but the punchy dialogue and potion creation mechanics separate it from anything else I've played. It's truly so cozy in art style, the vibe is fantastic, I just love it so much. Though I picked the wrong choices half of the time, I had an incredible time playing it and it is so charming. The Cosmic Wheel Sisterhood by Deconstruct Team didn't get the attention it deserved despite being in a Nintendo Direct. The visuals for this game are one of a kind, it's so soft and beautiful, there is a very fun tarot card game inside of it, and you get to explore friendships, the future, political things. It's really an absolutely beautiful game, I highly, highly recommend it, but it will make you cry so hard. It will make you cry so hard. Slay the Princess is actually the game that inspired me to make this video, even though a lot of people wouldn't call it cozy, but I call it cozy, I don't know. I'm not phased by gore, so maybe if you're phased by gore, you might not find it very cozy at all, and it's also a little bit stressful. It's not cozy, but you know what? It's cozy to me. It's cozy to me. It inspired me to make this video because it is so incredible. It's by Black Tabby Studios. It's an incredibly well done visual novel that explores morality, relationships, and the inner self. It's fully voice acted and the art style is so captivating. These recommendations are not anywhere near as underground or whatever as I would like them to be, but please, please, please leave your favorite games down below that you are looking forward to or small developers you want to support because they need it give cool, fun games the ability to exist. All in all, this video was basically a shout out to indie games. I completely understand the frustration with how dull, cozy games have seemed to veer lately, and I want better for the community as well, but money talks, and I wish money would shut the fuck up for once. Talk over money, support smaller games, support what you love, and make sure that indie developers are heard. Don't let Nintendo do all the fucking talking. Thank you guys so much for watching, I really appreciate you, and I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's not going to be something that everybody agrees with, and a lot of people will probably not be a huge fan of the way I approach this, but it is what it is, and I feel like either way, it's a win-win because I got to shout out some indie games, so even if you fucking hated this whole video, go check them out, bitch. Stay safe, stay wonderful, my friends, and I will see you next time. Thank you to all my members. I love you. Goodbye.